guess one could say that I took a turn to the dark side. Hell, it was Saturday night. The show was free. So why not give All Elite Wrestling a chance? Why not watch Fight for the Fallen, see what all the hubbub is about, and come on here and review it? Because, frankly, why not? And one of the things I feel like this channel truly lacks is a second product for me to get even at least a little bit emotionally invested in, which is what I had several years back with TNA, and this channel has sorely missed it. So there's part of that that's a hope for me that there's enough that I can sink my teeth into here where I can actually have reason and justification to start watching all elite wrestling. And if anything else, I feel like what I can bring to this whole YouTube community, the wrestling community as a whole, is balance when it comes to AEW. Because you are going to have those fans that are just going to geek out and mark out for every damn thing and let their bias show, and that's not very productive. You're also going to have those that are just going to want to poon and crap all over it no matter what, and that also is not going to be productive. I want to be that middle ground, believe it or not, and bring some balance to things. You might not always like what I say, which is why OTR Central is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need, but you'll at least know I'm giving you the real dope without any biases built in, because even when biases are there, I can look past biases to see the greater good. So let's go ahead and talk about Fight for the Fallen. If you want to be a big time kind of mainstream wrestling company and be taken seriously, there is nothing wrong with finding some safe charitable causes to back and support. Philanthropy is going to be a continually important form of business for companies all across the world in the 21st century. And All Elite Wrestling did well here to pick something safe, like supporting victims of gun violence, as a cause to sink their teeth into. I think it's great they raised $150,000 for that cause. You know, it's not like you're sitting there and supporting the Second Amendment versus gun control or anything like that. How could you really be against supporting victims of gun violence? Like I said, a really good, safe middle ground for a company to kind of sink their teeth into. Just be careful that it doesn't come across as too self-promoting and too self-aggrandizing. Like the segment at the very, very end after the main event and you bring out the check and everything, like that's great and that's cool, but that could be a little bit too much of look at me and we did this not because it was the right thing to do, we did this because it's gonna make us look good. And just don't fall into that WWE trap is all I'm saying. Still, really good cause and I salute you guys for supporting it. So oh, I did watch the pre-show on YouTube of that live stream, and I'll be curious to see how many people actually watched the main card on Bleacher Report Live, because when I was looking on YouTube, the most I saw in terms of viewers was about 35,000 or so. Now, we'll see how many actually watched the main card, but the pre-show, Sunny Kiss needs work, a lot of work, especially with some of the in-ring stuff. It looks slow and very deliberate. Uh... But he has promise, he has a character, he has a shtick, and the fans like him. The librarians could be something, but aren't. It's an example of being a gimmick, but not really being a gimmick, if that makes sense. Um, as far as that women's tag match, to me, it wasn't very good at all. Maybe the live viewing experience, if you were actually there at Daly's Plaza in Jacksonville, uh, was better. But watching it at home, watching it online, it was sloppy, choppy, and not very good. And it was really hard to concentrate once those captions came on the damn screen and wouldn't go away. Now you're trying to watch the action and all you see is text streaming across the screen. Stop it! Stop it! And how long does it take to figure out how to fix it? If you want to be taken seriously, if you want to be taken like your big time wrestling promotion, then you can't let Bush League crap like that happen and then continue to go on. And if you say, well, they're still a new company, so they're figuring it out and they're learning. That is partially true, absolutely. But they're not just trying to position themselves as a wrestling company. They're trying to position themselves as a big-time wrestling company. And you can't have this crap. That is unacceptable. And now is not the time to sit there and excuse it. Now is the time when you are new, when your TV deal has not officially started yet, 
to sit there and work out the kinks, figure out what works, figure out what doesn't, and fix it. To have that captioning go on for that many minutes in a match, completely unacceptable. Bush League looks like garbage. Makes your product look stupid. You can't have that. And if that's not bad enough, you've got a doctor of dentistry, fucking Britt Baker, doesn't even know which corner to go to for the hot tag. What the hell is going on here? How do you not know that? Like, that's a basic fundamental thing, talking about ring positioning and awareness and so forth. Now, surely Vince, if he saw this, would be like, hell, yeah, she thinks the Japanese girls all look the same. And she's right. Britt Baker, you're hired. But good Lord, not a good look at all when you are trying to establish yourself as a company that is to be taken seriously. As far as the look and the feel of the setup, I thought it was great. Reminiscent of those freaking spring break venues that WCW would use in the 90s or one of those beach setups without the beach. I thought it looked cool. I thought it looked clean. I thought it looked professional. I thought it looked big time. It looked really nice. It looked like the type of setup you would have for a somewhat major wrestling company. So if you're looking at something to help establish viability and credibility, this setup, this venue, that stage, it looked really good. Now I've got to say it because a lot of the AEW bots are going to obsess over this and obsess over this, talking about, hey, WWE is so bad and AEW is so awesome. Well, here's the thing. If you want to be counter programming to WWE, one of the things you don't want to have is a commentary team that sounds every bit as bad as what you get on Raw or SmackDown. Most fans that watch Raw or SmackDown universally agree, I believe at least, that the commentary sucks. So if I come to watch an AEW show, I don't want to also see commentary that sucks. Now granted, Jim Ross brings name credibility and recognition that is vital, but Something was off with him. He was not in top form. Even though I laughed every once in a while when he would cut off Excalibur and kind of gave that look like, hey, you're a ham and egg or let the professionals handle it. When it got to the actual matches itself, he was slow. He felt a little bit off pace. When you talk about some of the transitions for where they're going next, he's like, I think we're going here next. He can't have that stuff. And again, it doesn't matter as much because you're not on TV yet, but you got to figure this shit out. I think Alex Marvez has a great voice for TV and radio. I have no issues with him being involved. You know, the work that he does as a radio host for Fox Sports Radio, you know, it makes sense to incorporate a guy like Alex Marvez. Again, trying to get yourself a little bit of mainstream acceptance. But as a commentator, that's a big ask. I think he's better suited for a studio show, better suited to be like your main interviewer. Like imagine learning from other sports and other forms of entertainment like the NBA and what they do on TNT with Ernie Johnson and Shaq and Kenny the Jet Smith and Charles Barkley. That pregame show, that halftime show, that postgame show is better than the games at least half the damn time. Why not look to that and try to incorporate that into professional wrestling? Take Alex Marvez, make him that Ernie Johnson type, and find some guys that are off the wall that could be fucking characters. Why not? Be different. Be unique. I just don't know right now that Alex Marvez is best suited for this role. And as far as Excalibur, he's fucking weird to me. Uh, but with the matches, I thought he had some good moments. He showed some excitement level. He showed some passion. Uh, he did a good job of calling some of the spots. But when they were just regular talking and setting things up, I thought he was really off the mark. I don't know if that means that you automatically need to make changes to your commentary team now, but damn it all, there's a clear lack of face and heel dynamic. If you're going to have a three-man booth, to me, that's vital. You can't have three guys that come from the same side of the fence and they all sound the same, and that's exactly what we got here. If you want to be different, you want to be better, you want a counter program, then don't have commentary that sounds like it's straight out of the WWE playbook. From that opening six-man tag, it was clear as day that MJF and Sean Spears are a cut above those other guys. Guevara and Darby Allen and Jimmy Havoc and bad boy Joey Kinnear. Like, I couldn't imagine coming out of that match and thinking all six guys look great in there. They all look like they could be players. Man, you had two dudes that looked like players, and the rest of them looked like they were replaceable. I'm sorry, that's true. It's just the way it is. 
And what I didn't really like about this match, though, is how the heels didn't get along with each other. The heels were being heels to the heels. MJF sitting there doing the cartwheel and doing the 10 and Sean Spears' face is fucking fantastic. The bad guys don't get along with the other bad guys. I love it. What I don't love, though, is all the middle fingers in the damn match. Doing this doesn't make you cool or edgy. You do it too much, it makes you look like a moron. And it ruins the effect of other guys that matter more that are coming on later in the show, like Chris Jericho and Dustin Rhodes, when they do it. That's what's so stupid about it. You're flippantly flipping the bird to people like it doesn't matter. It doesn't make you look cool or edgy. It makes you look unoriginal and like you don't know how to fucking get over organically. And especially big boy Joey Janela. The fuck is wrong with you? You're in the middle of a match. You just hit a high impact spot. And you're laying on the mat outside of the ring. And you're flipping the bird to the camera and saying, fuck you, Cornette. No. You just prove once again... Why, when I always say the biggest marks are the ones in the fucking wrestling business, is absolutely true. If you don't like what Jim Cornette says, who gives a fuck? Prove him wrong. Do something to show that he's not right. Or best of all, ignore it and just do your own fucking thing. It doesn't make you look cool. It doesn't make you look hip. It doesn't make you look like a badass. It makes you look like a fucking moron. Good lord. You should be worrying about trying to get yourself over, trying to get the match over, trying to get AEW over. And instead, you're flipping off the camera and you're saying, fuck you, Cornette. No, fuck you, Joey Janela. Get your head out of your ass and stop being so sensitive. What really confused me about the Brandy Rhodes and Allen match is before the match, they went to great lengths to show this video package with Brandy Rhodes doubting herself and Brand Brandy Rhodes crying. She was in tears. And really trying to get a bunch of sympathy on her. So, like, as somebody who hasn't watched either one of the previous AEW shows, I had no clue that Brandy Rhodes was being portrayed as a bitch. Like, it just confused the fuck out of me. It didn't really make a whole lot of sense. I had somebody on Twitter point out that they're trying to go maybe for a sympathetic heel thing with Mick, like they did with Mick Foley back in the day. Well, that's what they're going for. It doesn't fucking work here. Like, you look at Brandy Rhodes, there is nothing to really get behind her as a sympathetic type of heel. It doesn't work. She's fucking gorgeous. She's married to one of the guys that runs the goddamn company. Like, why would we feel sympathy for her? And what's really confusing is you do all this to try and get sympathy on her, and then as soon as the match starts, it's all in-ring scheming and cheating and interference and all of this shit, and it's just weird. The most notable thing to me about this match was two things. One, that fucking trib leg scissors pin maneuver that Brandy put on Allie is spank bank worthy. Two, seeing Awesome Kong and Aja Kong. It was striking how they're bigger than most of the men on the fucking roster. And they look more like main eventers. A key thing for me watching Fight for the Fallen was not going to be the greatness of the matches. I'm looking for different things. I'm looking for more. I'm looking for characters that I can get invested in. I'm looking for performers that draw my interest. Looking for things that make me want to come back and watch again. Well, in that three-team tag match, the Luchasaurus was fucking it. Where you've got a company full of smaller guys that are kind of shaped like me and look like me. It's nice to see a dude at all of 6'5", 230 pounds. You look at the Luchasaurus, he looks like a fucking monster by comparison. Like, he was one of the real breakout stars of the night to me. He was one of those dudes that made you stop and take notice. And beyond question, the fans recognize that too. They ate this shit up. He was fucking badass. Of course, instead of having the right team win, a boy and his dinosaur, dinosaur Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, they had the lame-ass gimmick team, the Dark Order, win with a finish that fell flat. Sounds a lot like WWE, doesn't it? I mean, we're we keeping it real here, like... You have one character that's really connecting with the audience and really fucking getting over. So, of course, they have the wrong team win and the finish sucks. That sounds like WWE, and that just sounds like professional wrestling today, honestly. But War of the Luchasaurus.
He was fucking badass. Super bad Kip Sabian, earlier on the pre-show, did an interview, and it was kind of weird to me because he's trying to sell this kind of intense feeling, and it just didn't work, which should have been a foretelling of the match to come because his match with Hangman Page just didn't work for me. Like, based off of the person involved, especially Hangman Page, who's going to be wrestling for the AEW World title and all out, which I still think is a mistake. I would rather you see you have a tournament that starts off on your television come October, build up to that for a month, have a big show where Jericho wins the strap, and then you go from there. I mean, you got a month of programming built in just having a tournament play out on your television show. I'm just saying, like, a good introductory way to start off your company. But... They're going to go with trying to crown a cha champion on August 31st. It cannot be Hangman Page. You can't seriously think he's main event ready right now, do you? Like, who in the fuck looks at him and think that he's ready to carry the mantle of a company? Chris Jericho can carry the mantle of a company. Looks like he can carry a couple extra cheeseburgers around his waist. But frankly, Chris, it's okay. Rock the hell out of the dad bod. That's what I'm trying to do too, I guess. But Jericho has to be the winner at All Out. He just has to be. You cannot be so stupid as to put that belt around Hangman Page. If you do that, it will be a disaster. Just like this match was a slow, plotting disaster. And Jericho coming out afterwards and attacking him was cool and was a highlight of the night. But that's the thing. It was a highlight of the night because, in part, this match was so disappointing. So Kyle Uncensored and the Lucha Brothers. Initially, when this match was underway, I'm like... Don't go too much into the foolishness and the craziness. I like some hijinks and shenanigans, but don't do too much of it. But I got to say this. They didn't go too far down that path, and it's okay. But girl, Hebner, you got to catch that damn ball. You understand me? You can't say it the second time around. You fucked up. You fucked up. That's horrible. I did enjoy this match, though. It was one of my favorite matches of the night. And I especially enjoyed the Lucha Brothers. These fucking guys have a cool-ass look. Their move sets don't look so choreographed as you see out of a lot of Lucha guys, and frankly, the non-Lucha guys in wrestling today, they have a little bit of size to them. Like, they were fucking badass to me. How ironic. The Luchasaurus and the fucking Lucha Brothers. It's the Lucha guys, for God's sakes, that I enjoy the most, which is at this point in time when a lot of you are going to say, well, you should have watched Lucha fucking underground, you idiot, and you're probably right. I should have if this was the case. I enjoyed it a lot. Even the kind of weird sounding promo in the ring with the ladder afterwards. I'm like, cool. These guys are challenging the Bucks to yet another match, apparently. A ladder match at all out. Eh, whatever. But the Lucha Brothers, again, looking for gimmicks, looking for characters that I could get behind, that draw me in, that get me to watch more. It was the Lucha guys that really carried the day for me. I guess Chima versus Kenny Omega was supposed to be some type of really big deal. Maybe this was just an example of a company and commentary team trying to hype up something to be much bigger than it is. I don't know. I don't watch a ton of international wrestling, so I really have no clue who the fuck Chima is. I'm just being honest. Which is why it would have been really, really nice if the commentary team would have done a much better job of telling the backstory of these two guys, specifically Chima. They did a little bit, but they could have done more. He could have used a longer video package before this match to introduce us to the things that Chima could do or what he was about and what he's done and where he's been and what his life and wrestling journey looks like. It did this match a little bit of a disservice by not going far enough down that path. He did, sorry. Um, that said, when Kenny Omega slows down a little bit, his matches are so much better. So I don't always like when he wrestles somebody like an Okada. It's too quick, and he, they do too much. And there is, yes, an element of doing too much. When Omega slows down and sets up his moves a little bit better, actually tries to bother telling a story in the ring, that's when his matches really work. And this match did that, for the most part, until we got to the end and yet another flat finish. Now, maybe it was because Chima's knee was bothering him a little bit. It sure looked like that towards the end of the match. So that could potentially be... Excusable. But again, if you were trying to be different than other wrestling companies, especially the big evil corporation up in Stamford, Connecticut, 
You can't continue to have matches that fall flat, but that is a problem not exclusive to WWE. That is the wrestling business as a whole. You get too many false finishes, too much lack of storytelling, to when the finish finally comes, it's about two or three moves too damn late, and it just goes over like a fart in church. It was at this point that the length of the show was starting to get to me just a little bit. Damn it all. Not every show has got to be four hours long, guys. And I'm just talking to wrestling fans and the wrestling community as a whole. Not every show needs to be this damn long. And this was an example of a show that didn't need to be this damn long. Like the Chris Jericho promo. I mean, he was taking fools to promo school, and it's really nice to see a guy want to be hated. But one, I kind of wish he would have just cut this promo after he had attacked Hangman Page the first time. Personally, I think it would have helped the flow of the show a little better. And we really didn't need to have Hangman Page come back out and attack him. Like, stop with this 50-50 booking shit. Jericho got the one-up on him. Let Jericho have the one-up on him. Jericho's the guy you need to build up at this moment, frankly. Jericho's the guy you need to put the strap on. Let him be the star that he can be. Let him feel like the main eventer that he is. Let him feel like the world champion he's going to be. Don't sit there and undercut it because you got to make sure Hangman Page gets one in too. That's stupid. Main event time. The Rhodes Brothers versus the Young Bucks. Brothers versus brothers. Oh, before I get started. Lift, lift, lift. Fuck Cody Rhodes! There's a middle finger that matters. Uh, but as far as this match goes, you know, I have to say, Cody was about what Cody is. He's average to good. He's not terrible in the ring. He's not great in the wing, ring, but he most certainly was not the, the showcase piece here to me. You know, Dustin, I thought, looked great for a dude all of, what, 50 fucking years old? You know, like, he looked like he could still go. He looked like a guy that could contribute more to this damn company. You know, I like the fact that you have a Jericho, but you don't have too many guys like Jericho. You know, there is some value to having strategically placed legends mixed in throughout your product. If you want to have a Dustin Rhodes in your mid-card or in your tag team scene, that is perfectly fine and wonderful to me. Because you can use Jericho as kind of your top legend, if you will. But Dustin looked great. And the Young Bucks I found to be far less annoying than they usually are. Maybe that's because Dustin was in the match and naturally had to slow it down. But I found myself enjoying a Young Bucks match quite a bit more than I usually would. Although I wouldn't say that I thought this match was great. And that was in part because, again, the show was going on too long and I was about over it at this point. But if the Young Bucks could work like this a little bit more... They, they can be a little more tolerable. So when they start getting too flippy, super kicky, fucking nerdy, geeky, marky, and just throwing a bunch of shit out there, that it just doesn't work for me. But as a main event, I thought it was okay. This wasn't a show that mattered a whole lot in the grand scheme of things, because you don't have any television to tie into right now, and you're still six plus weeks away from All Out at the end of August. But it worked for me. It might have worked a little bit better for me if the show wasn't as damn long as it was, but, yeah, wrestling just can't get over itself with the damn show links. And I know there are going to be those people that are so sheepish and fanboyish and markish that they are just geeking out and spanking the bank to this fucking show. See, it was great, it was awesome, and the future is so bright, and I'm a good... <laughs> oh. This is where it can get annoying when dealing with professional wrestling and wrestling fans. Just because it's not WWE doesn't automatically make it great. Okay? Let's judge it based off of its own merit. And, and even in that case, if you're sitting there and saying, well, this is better than anything WWE's put on in years, get, it, get the fuck over yourself. This was not that great of a show. Let's get that perfectly clear. You had technical issues. Commentary was whack for the most part. You had several matches where the finishes fell flat. Some instances that felt like the wrong teams won. You had a couple of good matches sprinkled in. And you had some characters that really showed up very well. And I felt like did a good showing for themselves. But that does not make it a great show. Nor did this necessarily have to be a great show. Just give the people something to bring them back for more. And depending on your perspective, you probably got something out of that, out of this show. And that's okay. 
but let's not sit there and mark out to this so bad that you have absolutely no standards because you're not doing this company any fucking justice at all. This is not the time to fanboy and mark out to every fucking thing. This is the time to, if anything, be hypercritical and show your support by voicing your concerns, your displeasure, the things you would like to see be done better. Figure out what works, keep doing it, and improve that. Figure out what doesn't work, and fix it, and get better. This is the time. This is kind of like your dry runs. Until you're on TV in October, it doesn't matter as much. So stop kissing their ass like every fucking thing they do is great. Because clearly watching this on Bleacher Report Live on Saturday night, they have some issues and things to work through. That doesn't mean they fucking suck. That doesn't mean this company's automatically going to fail. I'm not saying any of that. But for crying out loud, when I was looking at social media, you got people acting like that this is going to put the WWE out of fucking business. Pump the brakes a little bit. And more importantly... Focus on AEW and making AEW better before you worry about taking on the Titan Tower machine. Can we do that? And can we judge AEW based off of its own merits, its positives, its negatives, its goods, and its shortcomings instead of always trying to compare it to somebody else? This was the trap that TNA and its fanboys fell into for years. And how did that ultimately work out? Those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And that's why I'm here. So I don't want to see AEW fall into that fucking trap. And that's why, damn it all, OTR Essential is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need.